officially, I would like to welcome you to this evening's program called In Her Shoes, Insights, Perspectives, and Stories from Women of Color in Philanthropy. We'll take a round of applause because that's a powerful title and we're about to have a powerful night. <laughs> So for those who I have may not have met as of yet, my name is Telly Andre Thomas and I really am delighted to welcome you to this space um, and thank you for sharing time and intention with us this evening. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as the director of Candid, some of you formerly know us as Foundation Center, and I'm also the proud member of the executive committee uh, for the Soul of Philanthropy Cleveland, which brings you this program this evening. Less than one, th one month ago, we had about 400 individuals that joined us at the Cleveland History Center to um, celebrate those who give black and to officially open the exhibit, The Soul of Philanthropy, reframed and exhibited. That night was a culmination of more than 18 months of work and passion and dedication um, that helped to launch a shared vision for inclusive and high impact philanthropy. That vision was formed by founding partners, Cecil Liscombe of the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland. Give it up for Cecil. <laughs> Myself, representing Candid, and a, yep, shout out for Candid. We'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. And two local philanthropists, Connie Hill Johnson, who's in the audience, and her partner and husband, Kevin Johnson. So we knew 18 months ago that the solo philanthropy would be more than just a moment, but ultimately it was going to be a movement. The energy and the intention from that night, just one month ago, has helped us to expand and direct an inclusive conversation around philanthropy, black philanthropy in particular, right here in the city, as well as become part of a larger engagement in a national dialogue about black philanthropy. In addition, it has added Cleveland to the roster of cities who have hosted the National Traveling Exhibit, the Soul of Philanthropy, reframed and exhibited. It has garnered charitable contributions from more than 125 individuals, donors, and foundations. And because of your presence tonight, that number has multiplied yet again, so thank you for your support. And as importantly, our vision has led to the establishment of the Cleveland Black Equity and Humanity Fund. This is something that I'm particularly proud of because this is a sustainable fund that was seeded by African Americans and allies to support and facilitate philanthropic investment in causes and issues that promote and support black-led social change for economic prosperity throughout Northeast Ohio. None of these achievements would have been possible if we did not have the tremendous amount of talent, passion, and dedication and commitment from volunteers, whether they be it in the civic community, business, um, faith, or otherwise. They've given so generously of their time, talent, and treasure. It's all right. They've given generously of their time, talent, and treasure to help make this possible. So I have to take a moment to ask our host committee members, our steering committee members, and all of our volunteers to please stand up and wave and be acknowledged because you are the engine that helps make this happen. And then because I have the mic, I have to also thank my small but mighty team, Sam Petticord, and Dave Holmes, who have been holding me down at Foundation Center, now Candid, because in the midst of us becoming Candid, they have also enthusiastically embraced this partnership too, and you bring your A game every time. So thank you so much. Collectively, we have all united to create a vehicle to educate and inform audiences about the rich history of African American charitable giving. And we created a vehicle to tell our stories, empower communities of color, and help to cultivate the next generation of givers and doers. According to the Council of Foundations, the proportions of women and those of racial and ethnic minority backgrounds on staff has changed very little in the last five to 10 years. With that, it reminds us that black women, myself included, share very rare air and space and vantage points of not only serving as foundation leaders or staff, but as trustees and or donors. 
This evening, Candid has assembled a panel of four very dynamic, pioneering, just really bad sisters, like y'all in the presence of, right? You just gotta give credit where credit is due. Um, just some tremendous sisters who are shaping, challenging, and redefining philanthropy as we know it. I have personally had the privilege to seek and benefit from their wisdom and their journey, form friendships over the years, and find encouragement and affirmation through their personal examples of being givers and doers. When we think about the world today, we know that there are tensions that we consistently face, be it racism, sexism, classism, inequity in our pay, opportunities, wealth, social justice, oppression, you name it, the list can go on and on and on. We also know that some of those tensions show up in the space of philanthropy too. Tonight, these women are going to share their stories, their insights, and their perspectives on being a black woman and what that experience has been like in the space of philanthropy. As I prepare to introduce our moderator and panelists, I invite us all to open our hearts and our minds and be present for what I think is a very critical and timely conversation. So before I do these introductions, I gotta do three quick housekeeping measures and try not to get feedback. Thank you, Lewis. The first, if you have not heard of Ms. Valeda Fullwood and her book, Giving Back, it is for sale by the beautiful Lizzie from United Black Fund. This book was the impetus for the um, tremendous exhibit that is on display at the Cleveland History Center. You can purchase the book for $40 tonight, um, cash or check or credit. Lizzie takes it all. And proceeds from the book helps to continue to fuel these programs and seed the fund that I mentioned earlier. The second announcement is that we invite you to come see philanthropy differently. So if you not journeyed to the museum as of yet, right down the hill, University Circle, Cleveland History Center. The exhibits are on display until December 6th, so not only will you see the National Traveling Exhibit, but you will see the inaugural, the wonderful Celebrate Those Who Give Black. That is the creation of this community that is celebrating and amplifying our givers and doers in black Cleveland, so it really is a must see. And then the last thing that I ask of you is to follow us on social media. You see all of these ways you can connect with us. As I said, the conversation um, tonight is going to be tremendous, but we don't want it to stay in this room. So make sure you are on Twitter or on IG or however you social. Um, and when you do, we ask that you use the hashtag TSOPCLE, all caps. And then we're also going to try to make trend BLK. W-M-G-I-V-E, Black Women Give for tonight as well. Okay, so now the best part, I get to introduce these wonderful women. So I am going to start with our moderator, who I believe traveled the farthest to be with us, so thank you again, Susan. First, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Susan Taylor Batten. Give it up, give it up. Susan is the President and Chief Executive Officer of AFI, which is a philanthropic, excuse me, a philanthropic partnership for black communities established in 1971 as the Association of Black Foundation Executives. It is a membership-based um, philanthropic organization that advocates for responsive and transformative investments in black communities. Since joining AFI in 2009, Susan led um, Susan has led the organization's philanthropic advising and programming on responsive philanthropy. Currently, she serves on the board at the United Philanthropy Forum and the Schott Foundation for Public Education and is also the adjunct lecturer at the Valdry Center for Philanthropy at Su Southern University. Again, Susan Batten, excuse me, Susan Taylor Batten. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Latita Smith. Welcome home. Latita is the president and CEO of Moses Taylor Foundation, where she provides leadership and oversight for the foundation's grant making and administration to advance its mission to improve health and wellness for residents and communities in Northeast Pennsylvania. Yes, I said Northeast Pennsylvania. Prior to joining Moses Taylor, she spent 12 years right here at the St. Luke's Foundation of Cleveland, Ohio. 
At St. Luke's, she led the implementation of the foundation's program strategy approach, streamlined the community grant making process, and expanded partnerships with grantees. She is the board chair of Grant Makers for Effective Partner, excuse me, of, of Effective Organizations, and previously chaired the board of funders concerned about AIDS. She was selected as an American Marshall Memorial Fellow and the Association for Black Foundation Executives Connecting Leaders Fellow, Ms. Latita. Lester Smith. All right, our last two for the evening, Jennifer Roller was elected the president of the Raymond J. Ween Foundation in 2014. Her tenure began with the foundation in 2007, serving as the vice president and interim president, respectively. The Ween Foundation has benefited from her dynamic leadership, community insight, and commitment to vision. She has been integrally involved in the development and implementation of the foundation's strategies, developed and supervised the foundation's neighborhood success as well as their leadership program. Before coming to the foundation, she was director of Upward Bound and Scope at Youngstown State University. In 2012, she earned the distinction of being named one of 10 national fellows in the Association of Black Foundation Executives Connecting Leaders Fellowship. Jennifer Roller. All right. And another hometown girl, Ms. Lorna Wisham, is the president of the First Energy Foundation. All right, which awards grants to qualified not-for-profit tax-exempt organizations. In this role, she is responsible for community giving and engagement initiatives, employee volunteerism, and community board placements for executives. She also carries the responsibility and title of Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Corporate Involvement for First Energy Corp. Headquartered in Akron, Ohio, First Energy is um, has 10 electric distribution companies to form one of the nation's largest investors own electric systems serving 6 million customers in the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic regions. She serves on numerous boards, including Cuyahoga County Community College Foundation, United Way of Greater Cleveland, and is a trustee for university hospitals. Please join me in welcoming these four dynamic women to the stage, and I am gonna pass the mic to Ms. Susan. <laughs> How you doing? Oh gosh! Uh, thank you, Telange. She she brought us up good and strong, didn't she? We like no pressure, no pressure. Okay, all right. Um, it is great to be here. As Telange said, I, I may have come the farthest. Uh, the Association for Black Foundation Executives is so. Here's my story. It's based in New York. I live in Maryland and I'm not in either place much because I'm usually on the road, right? So uh, this is the tail end of a 10-day road trip. I try not to do it that hard all the time. One of the questions I have is how we take care of ourselves leading. Um, but I, I was in San Diego uh, last week. We had a powerful conversation with um, black foundation trustees from around the country. We, we organized trustees in conversations about how they use their seats in boardrooms to push agenda for our community. That was pretty amazing. We had 17 foundations represented, majority from the South, which is something that is really important for us. Um, then I went from San Diego to Seattle um, and met with some ABFI members, and I think that's when I caught this bit of a head cold that I have. So, um, uh, but um, I met with some members there, um, but I couldn't wait actually to be here uh, because this room, Sisters, I know there are a few men in the room, but sisters have turned out, so thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Um, you know, huge respect and thanks to the hosts of this event. First, let me just say, um, um, Telange mentioned Valeda Fullwood. The insight and the brilliance of Valeda Fullwood and Charles Thomas, who really are the founders of the soul of philanthropy, um, just amazing. I know she's going to see this or hear this. But just give, yeah, a hand to the Leda Fullwood and, and Charles. Um, and then second to everybody here um, on the committee in Cleveland that brought us here. I know all of us thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. You know, the, the story um, or the narrative about philanthropy in this country is so skewed, right? There's a, there's a false narrative about who are givers and who are takers. And often our community is painted as takers 
And once you sort of paint somebody as a taker, that just gives you the right and give folks the right to just do anything they want, right? Um, to move bad policy and the like. And so this exhibit, this program is so important because we know that people of African descent are the most giving people, not only in this country and in the world. So I'm really excited about this being here. I was tweeting it out um, on my way here. This exhibit needs to go to every city in this country, every corner, and I would say also some parts of the world, because again, the narrative about who we are um, is just a false narrative. So that's why I think this is critically important and appreciate all the work that you all have done here. Um, so tonight, we're gonna have the opportunity to hear from three women. And as Tella Andre said, these sisters are running things. They are, they are basically running things. Um, they all are leading foundations um, and have ties to Cleveland and Ohio in some way. Um, I know Latita and Jennifer, we haven't seen each other in years. And so I'm um, just happy to be with you again. And Lorna, um, my sorority sister and I are, are meeting. Oh, here we go, here we go, yes, yes. That's okay. The thing is that sisters, sisters, actually, we all lead, we all give, right? That is our history. That is our amazing history. So I had to put that in there real quick, Lorna. Um, so um, I am excited about meeting you as well and just hearing about your work. Um, so we're going to hear about their experiences, their, their hopes about philanthropy and foundations in particular. Uh, that's the work that we uh, mostly focus on at Abvi. And um, it, the event is entitled In Her Shoes. Uh, we are all sisters sitting up here. I actually had my t-shirt on um, today that says stand with black women. And I was actually going to wear my t-shirt. But I thought, no, maybe I should put on a dress or something. I know <laughs> my mother is watching me somewhere. But I love to, wa I love to wear that t-shirt around because you know, folks stare at me. And I'm trying to figure out, why are they looking at me? I had it on today walking around, um, around the university. And then I realized, oh, yeah, I got on, I got on my t-shirt. So that's right. So, we're going to jump in and have a conversation. And we do want this to be a discussion. We're going to open it up at some point and, and hope that we can converse with you. Um, but I really want to start by asking all of you to just talk a little bit about sort of how you first um, came to your experience or understanding of philanthropy. We all have different definitions and the way in which we pro approach this work. So if you can talk a little bit about um, how you first came to your understanding of philanthropy as a way to introduce your your thoughts there. And anybody can start. Oh yeah, we have to pass the mic. There's gonna be a little bit of a <laughs> Supremes moment here. We're gonna have to all get behind like two mics. There you go. Be careful, we will start singing up there. I know, right? I'm not sure you want that. But, um, so first of all, uh, thank you to Teleange and the full committee related to this event. It is really a pleasure to be here this evening and I hope to learn as much um, from these two incredible women to my left and to my right um, as everyone in the audience is expected to as well. Um, your question about how did we come to philanthropy? So if you think about the root of the word, uh, is it philanthropia, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. means to love, mankind, kindness, humanity. When I stop and think about that, I immediately think about my parents. Mm -hmm. I know my mother is here somewhere, ah. and I do want to give her a quick little Where shout out so Hi. that I can say it first. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's but right. she had to take a bow. <laughs> but, um, but honestly, when I, when I think about love, and I think about kindness, I immediately think about mm -hmm. my parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, philanthropy wasn't immediately related to wealth. Mm -hmm. It wasn't connected to contributions mm -hmm. or donations or um, you know, incredible grants. It, it wasn't related to mm -hmm. any of that. Mm -hmm. It was simply related to building family, building home, building community um, with the friends that my parents actually in, enjoyed being with. And listening to them, who eventually, most of them, became my mentors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helped my sister and I uh, grow, I, I think, to become the women that we are today. But really to open our eyes to what this community mm -hmm. um, has to offer us. Mm -hmm. And so that love and that kindness 
um, is what I bring with me to work every day. Yes. And I think about the work that I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I would say I, um, the word philanthropy, I did not become familiar with, quite honestly, until I was introduced to the Raymond John Wee Foundation um, a dozen years ago. It wasn't something we talked about in undergrad. It wasn't a part of my nonprofit. I'm, you know, a practitioner at Roots, mm -hmm. so it wasn't, we had state funds and federal funds, and that was the extent of, you know, our introduction. But I think about when I saw the questions around giving, and it reminded me of my grandma and going to church on Sundays. And she would call on Saturday and she would ask my siblings and I, do you have your money for church tomorrow? <laughs> and we're like, yes ma'am. So she'd pick us up and we would put our own coins in the plate. And then she would give us each a dollar, because back then a dollar was a lot of money. She would give us a dollar to put in the envelope so that we could go up front because it was very important, I think, the public part of it for us to participate. And then she would also give us each a dollar, like she'd fold her hand up and put it on top of ours and give us a dollar. And so I think my connection to that is the giving in, one, you pay yourself, and then you also, in different increments, give back to your community, whatever that looks like for you. So I think that's the motto I still like personally follow. Mm -hmm. Amounts are a little larger, but mm -hmm. that's where it came <laughs> right. from. Yeah, yeah, Latina. Um, so I, I think that for me also, um, when I think about the origins of giving for me, I think about um, my father being the uh, block club president of our streets. Um, I think about their involvement of our church, and that was just part of how we lived our lives. Um, and I remember when I applied for a job at St. Luke's Foundation that I actually looked up the word philanthropy in the dictionary because I wasn't <laughs> certain what it meant, yeah, and it felt yeah. like that might be on the, the test or something. So I remember looking that up. But looking back, when I think about when I first learned about what philanthropy is, it was... It really happened for me when I was working for the Cleveland Health Department, which was before I actually entered philanthropy. And I was overseeing the AIDS program. And it was a time when um, I really came to understand how um, government and foundations and people who were living with the disease and nonprofits all came together to figure out how to do that well together. And so um, that was very early in my um, career, and I think that it really shaped the way that I understood um, social problems, I think, in a broader way. I think all of us are sharing the story about family and community, and isn't this something like you wanted to look up the word, and several talked about looking up the word. Isn't it funny how words can be taken from a community and given back, called something else, and we think we don't know what it is, and we're trying to figure out how to pass the test to your point. So, so what about, um, and it, the same is for me, I think about family, I think, you know, when we talk about the village, um, it takes a village, that's what, to me, philanthropy means. Um, so, um, talk a little bit about sort of how you do your philanthropy in terms of any personal brand, and also want to hear a little bit of how you got to your role. So now we're moving into the professional, sort of the professional sort of uh, occupation of philanthropy. Um, talk how you got there and also um, what are the values and principles that drive the way you lead philanthropic organizations? I would start with um, overall what I, what I do at the foundation is have an understanding of some of the social challenges and issues in our community and then reframe them through our strategic priorities, mm -hmm. um, community development and revitalization, economic opportunity, education, and then through the lens of race equity and inclusion, start to um, work with the nonprofit organizations, government, businesses, community on how we come together to make some impact in our community. I started with the foundation in 2007 and as a program officer. And again, trying to get my understanding of how the work was done, how it was different than anything I'd seen before, um, did just fine because it was a lot about community engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, the work that I was hired to do was a community uh, grassroots grant making program. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I live, that's what I did. Um, meetings, convenings, uh, partnerships came pretty naturally because that's what I've been doing. Um, I think where it started to shift for me was, I think at heart I'm a builder, so when the community leadership um, uh, 
uh, grassroots grant making program had its legs, it was like, now what? What else is this a part of and what else can I do to contribute? And so I had ideas that I could be a vice president. Um, <laughs> it wasn't on our books we had at all. It wasn't on our policy and our manual, but I was like, well, that doesn't mean it can't be. So for me, it was, I found interesting. I shared with our then um, president this idea and he looked at it and he said to me, um, I see at most you as a senior program officer. Wow. Wow. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I don't know that I heard the rest of what he said. But <laughs> <laughs> you know how you go deaf. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh -huh. But I heard a voice, and I'm sh I believe it was God, said, take your paper back. And so I did. I said, may I have it? And I said, well, thank you for listening. And I put it away. And as luck would have it, uh, he moved on pretty quickly. <laughs> And our board chair asked, he's like, what are your thoughts? What are your aspirations? Um, are you considering you know, the position of president? I said, I'm not actually, but I have this description for vice president that I've been working on. And I worked with him, I worked with our personnel committee and was um, promoted to vice president and then served as, oh, thank, yeah. you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and served as um, interim president while a search went on. Um, long story short, we just took some time. The board didn't reach consensus on the president's search. And as a part of my ongoing conversations and work with the, the chair and the board and staff, we just took some time to continue to work together. I was interim for six, nine months. And the community, folks in our black community were like, we're rooting for you. And then it turned to, wait a minute, why won't they give you this job? Uh -huh, and I was uh -huh. like, no, no, I'm not asking for this job. <laughs> and a, a really uh, trusted colleague said, oh, I get it. You and the foundation, you guys are dating. And I, it was an awesome way to think about it. My trying to understand the job and if that's something that I wanted to do in the way that I thought it should be done and whether or not they trusted my brand of leadership. Yeah. And we came together on it. I did a fellowship, um, I'm sorry, not the fellowship, but it was a leadership program. I called Gordon that week at the end of the week and I said, I'd like to be the president of the Raymond John Wee Foundation. And that was in February. And then in March, the board named me president. So ah, that's you my know story. What? You know, the, the, um, the story there, Jennifer, about just, um, that was lesson number one when you said there wasn't a vice president position. It doesn't mean that there can't be. So just going for it, like that's, a, and particularly in philanthropy and foundations, I often say to folks, you know, everything's on the table, actually. These are private organizations often that can sort of make, you know, changes and the like. But I have a follow-up question, actually, around um, your brand and sort of how you do your work. Um, you said, so you look at what the foundation does in terms of its sort of work. Um, you, you have your own understanding. Then you said you bring a lens of race and equity. Can you just yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yes, um, so the last several years, we, uh, the foundation, started to do some work with our thought partners, Third Space Action Lab, some of you may know them, and having some really crucial conversations about, yes, the work we're doing, we're right in the urban core of Warren and Youngstown, but you really couldn't distinguish us from anybody else. You could look at our work, you could hear our stories, but you could put us up against 10 other folks and you wouldn't know that that, we said, uh, resident engagement was our focus, um, racial equity, but again, it was really vanilla. And so we started to do some internally first. All of our staff became trained in the two-day. Our board caught on immediately thereafter. And I mean, I'm talking to organizations who they're, they say, you know, my board just won't do this. Our board 100% off the bat was trained. And then we made an expectation of our grantees, their leadership, their board and their staff as a condition of funding, also have to have the training. So we just started to it, run with it, quite honestly. Um, if we're gonna say the resident engagement, community engagement, race equity, our success, then we have to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. And so that, and that's what for me personally, and it's luck would have it again, the foundation believes in it strongly. So it's in total alignment. So I, I appreciate that. And, and something else you said, I'm going to move over to you, Lorna, but something you said, Jennifer, I want to come back to the statement, um, oh, I see you most as a senior vice president, right? Those are the little, those are the little digs that happen every day that ultimately impact us in big ways. And we just need to talk about that. So I, I want to put a pin in that one, actually. So 
But Lauren, a little bit about how you got to the role and just your principles around how you lead sure. in the sector. Sure. Yep. So while Jennifer and her foundation board were courting, my foundation board, I actually jumped right in and got married immediately. <laughs> Um, we had about a year ago, uh, as most folks from Northeast Ohio knows, um, about uh, 500 or so uh, uh, individuals that worked for First Energy that opted for a buyout. Uh, with that kind of turnover, with a company, even with you know, 14 to 15,000 employees, uh, it was still a very, very significant impact. Um, particularly in departments like communications and some areas like engineering on the operation side. But the foundation side lost four of the five employees. I've been with the company since 2005, since November 2005. When I was first hired with the company, I actually, uh, there's this whole process around uh, HR with a talent profile. You, they ask you to spend some time, you know, outlining your weaknesses and your strengths and where would you like to see yourself in three to five years? Are you willing to relocate? Uh, what, are, what are your interests? What are, what are your desires? What do you want to do with the company? I literally listed three jobs. The one that I had applied for, the next one that, that I just left in DC, and the one I have now. So I, I'm grateful and blessed. I do think that timing uh, has a lot to do with it. Um, we are currently uh, led, and I say currently because I, I wish he would stay forever, but I'm not sure how long our CEO, Chuck Jones, will stay. But we are led by a man that absolutely understands, lives and breathes diversity and inclusion. And he recognized that not only uh, was the executive leadership mostly white male that we needed to do something about it. So you can recognize it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but right. then you need to do something about it That's as well. Right. Right. And he chose to do something about it. So I, uh, people thank him and he's just like, oh, it's not a big deal. And they're like, no, it's a very big deal that you made the decision to not only bring me home, and I actually came home for a very short period of time. I was working for the Illuminating Company in Brexville, which is one of First Energy's operating companies. And within four weeks, unbeknownst to me, the president of the foundation and uh, literally four of her uh, staff decided to take the buyout. So uh, sometime after vacation in August of last year, I was called by my current boss and said, you've been reassigned. That was the terminology. I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> Uh, because understand I just returned from seven years in Washington, D.C. as a federal lobbyist, mm -hmm. and I was praying that he was not sending me back there. <laughs> so as much as I love D.C., like the work days. was very Ooh, challenging, yeah. Stephanie, yeah. as you know. <laughs> right. So um, I was grateful to be here and grateful for the opportunity and spent uh, September through last year really uh, learning as much as I could learn while the current president of the foundation was there hiring three new people, uh, transitioning, you know, my own personal life. So the first six months of this role um, were quite personally challenging. Um, the last six months of this role, now that I'm in it, uh, as of January, became the president of the foundation. Uh, now, uh, I heard the term the other day, driving the car while changing the tires. Has anyone heard that? <laughs> Is that, that like is a, flying the plane? What is it? It's flying, flying the plane by plane. fueling or something. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't know if it's a car, if it's an 18-wheeler truck, but from day to day, yeah. it has been quite um, a joy. And, and I, I have to call it a joy and smile. Uh, it's the only way to get through it. But the company is going through a significant change right now. And uh, to learn the department help the four folks that we hired in the department learn the department. None of them were from or within the community involvement space at all. So all of us are actually spending time learning what this work is and then being asked to create a strategic plan in the process. So if anyone has ever been faced with that challenge, learning a new job and creating a strategic plan, it's not easy. But um, I take it a day at a time and that's really my personal brand. That's the best that I can do, is take it a day at a time. Yeah. This is something that I personally um, am passionate about, the work um, and, and the community that we serve. 
Um, I've said before that I, I had two other roles, City of Cleveland, working for two different mayors, mm -hmm. that those were probably one of the two of the best jobs that mm -hmm. I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I think this one may very well top it. And wow. even with all of the challenges, mm -hmm. the opportunity to impact communities and transform lives and really make a change in a broader capacity mm -hmm. and with someone else's checkbook, mm -hmm. it's a great thing. <laughs> a great so thing. I'm, I'm very, very pleased. And very grateful. And when you say it's a joy, you actually do mean that. I can, I can, I, I yeah. do, I do yeah. mean it. It's, um, there's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, uh, we processed almost 1,300 grants last year. Uh -huh. um, you know, anywhere between eight and nine million dollars mm -hmm. and spent uh, for 2018, and mm -hmm. we're certainly on track for that again in 2019. Mm -hmm. My challenges really are taking a look at where I want to take the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I met Francis, where's Francis? I want to say Oct in the back <laughs> earlier, Francis Post. Um, and something she said to me stuck earlier today, and it wasn't about uh, what I am, uh, what, what I'm learning, or what, what I have learned that the foundation used to do. It's really about what I can do taking the foundation going forward. Did I get that right? <laughs> and she's go. absolutely right. And when you uh -huh. think about it, it's um, we're at a time now when you have leadership that's uh, supportive of diversity and inclusion, uh, when you have a community that is faced, particularly a black community that's faced with a number of significant issues around poverty and lead and just job access, college readiness, those kinds of opportunities. They don't come, I mean, they've existed. But now I'm in a place and a space and time where I can actually be transform transformational. That's right. yeah. And um, that's what brings me joy every day, yeah. even though it is a lot of work with a very small team and hoping and praying that my boss understands that and grows <laughs> my team very soon. But um, it, I, I take it, I'm, I'm just grateful. I, I appreciate the frame about um, being able to be transformational when we get into these seats. We've got a, there's a foundation out in LA, uh, the Liberty Hill Foundation, and their tagline is change, not charity, right? It's what we in fact can do when we get in these seats and really use the power of philanthropy and other people's money, to your point, um, <laughs> to, to really make substantive change. So I'm gonna go there in a minute, but, but um, Latita, a little bit about how you got to the role and your principles and values that drive your leadership there. Uh, so I, have, I had lived my whole life in Cleveland, and I worked for the Cleveland Health Department, I worked for Planned Parenthood of Cleveland, and then I worked for St. Luke's Foundation of Cleveland for 12 years. And Cleveland for me was home base. Um, you know, there are folks in Cleveland who can't wait to leave, but I was not one of those folks. I actually recruited my husband from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. And so we imagined that we would be here forever. And I worked for a foundation that I absolutely loved. Like I imagined that there could be no better place in the world, friends excluded, um, to do philanthropy than St. Luke's Foundation. I loved it that much. Um, and then the organization changed. Um, and also I outgrew my position, which was a really scary place to be in. And I remember I had the privilege of actually participating in a women's leadership um, retreat that um, Susan's organization held. And it was right at that moment where I was thinking, you know, I have outgrown this position. It's like when you have shoes that you know are too small for you. And yet my dad was like, has the paycheck bounced? <laughs> and, and it hadn't. You know, and I looked around and I love philanthropy. So when I also thought if I leave, where am I going to go? Because there weren't other open positions in philanthropy I could just insert myself into. Um, but it really got to a point that um, I just did not see my future there. And so I left. And I left and I didn't have a job. Um, and my family relied on my paycheck. And so um, my husband is not here, but I am so grateful that he is still my husband. Because it was... <laughs> It was um, not an easy decision for us to make. Um, but, you know, there are those times in your life where you feel like, I am going to bet on me. And for me, it was one of those times. And so when I left St. Luke's Foundation, the good thing about leaving, a, probably the only good thing about leaving a job is that then you can look for a job out loud, because everybody knows you don't have a job. <laughs> 
Um, and there are a lot of opportunities that came my way. A lot of people thought because I worked in philanthropy that I could be their development director. Like I could translate my relationships to make it rain for them, um, which maybe I could, I don't know, you know, if I could have done that. Because it is a skill that just because you give away money doesn't mean you know how to ask for money. Um, but people thought that I could do that. And then there were a whole bunch of other things people thought I could do or thought I should be doing other than the thing I wanted to do, which was philanthropy. And then this opportunity came for me to go to Scranton, Pennsylvania. I had never been to Scranton. I had seen the office, but I had never been to Scranton, Pennsylvania. But it was a brand new foundation. And to me, there was something intriguing about the opportunity that I could build a foundation from the ground up and the way I felt it should be built. And so I really struggled with it. And I tell you, one of the women who I met at the retreat um, that Susan held um, is Unique Redwood. She is not my friend, she's just a girlfriend. Um, but she was someone who I met at the retreat and she said, if you ever need anything, give me a call. And I told her, you know, I had this opportunity in Scranton. You know, there, there are 75,000 people who live in Scranton and less than 1% of them are black. Like that is the deal in Scranton. I serve an 11 county region that is largely rural. And I mean like Confederate flag, real rural. Is it, you know, is this something I should do? And she said to me that um, I should go where the opportunity is and trust that my leadership will carry me there. And so I said to my husband, why don't we give this a try? Um, and it has been an amazing experience. I have built a phenomenal foundation. <laughs> and it's been an amazing experience. It has been tough. I mean, my kids go to a school where there are five black kids and two of them are my kids. And so that is tough, you know? And for me, when I was here in Cleveland, so you asked about your approach to philanthropy, to me it was all about the love that I have for this place and these people. And so I thought, you know, if I go there, will I feel the love for those folks? And will that affect how I do the job? Um, and it is not the same, it's not the same doing the job there as it, is, as it was doing the job here, um, but I found that there was a lot of good work that I could do. And at the root for me, when I think about the way I approach philanthropy, um, I originally went to college because I thought I wanted to be an English professor, because I really love literature, and women's autobiography in particular is what I studied in graduate school, and I love the idea about the power of our stories. And so I think that what I do in this field is I hold space for people's stories. So I get to be in rooms that people, I didn't even know existed before I came into this field. And I get to tell the stories of people who are living in our community. And I help people understand the stories behind the stories that they see in the newspaper. Um, and that is a great privilege. And to me, I think of myself as a, as a translator of stories, as someone who holds space for other people, creates space for people to tell their own stories. Yeah, that, and, saying, and that's your solo, right? Okay. <laughs> I am forever indebted. I mean, when we were on the phone, and like I say, I've known Latita for a while, but I, I thought you were here. I don't know why I thought you were still in Cleveland. And I said, you moved, you moved to Northeast Pennsylvania? <laughs> like, as you say, Confederate flag Pennsylvania. But the other thing that you said, again, just putting a pin in it, um, in terms of the risk you took to leave, and you said, my family depends on my paycheck. And I just want to, again, lift that up. My family depends on my paycheck. We carry so much of our families, right, in the work that we do as black women. Um, so I just didn't want, to, I didn't want to let that go. I definitely didn't want to let that go. Um, so um, just I'm curious, and, and also to, to build on your notion of stories, and, and that's what you give space for, Latita. Why do you all think this conversation about black women in this sector is an important conversation to be having. And then I want to move into what is it, what the, what the experience is, but just why is this an important conversation for us to be in? Wow. Um, I would say, um, I think even Telianje noted it in her opening remarks, there's so few of us. And um, Angela Glover Blackwell, which my, whole team knows this is my girl. She doesn't know it, but she is. <laughs> um, I remember I was on a trip, and she was there, and I had a moment to spend with her. We went to the bathroom together. That's a story for another time. And, 
And we were lost. And I was like, I thought it was just me. I'm, ge you know, geographically challenged. And I, I did. I thought it was just me. And she says, we have this way of making ourselves believe we're the only ones. And that's why I feel like strongly we are not. There are a few, very few, but we are not the only ones. And we cannot do it alone or go it alone. And so... 50 people, 60 people in the room to hear about it and talk about it and share the experience, I think is just one more um, opportunity to provide like that insight and access to that. Yeah. Thank you. I actually want to share, when you talk about Angela Glover Blackwell, we all have the one, right, that we want to be when we grow up one day. Um, and I finally said to her, I had to send her my professional headshot. It's not the one that's on the material today, but the one I typically use I have a black turtleneck on, and I've got kente cloth over my shoulder. Did I not copy her directly, right? I even took my picture just like her, because that sister is bad as I don't know what. So I'm with you, Jennifer. I, I sort of, she is like, and I had the opportunity to interview her at our women's retreat two, two weeks ago, two years ago, rather, flew from Jamaica from my vacation to interview that woman, and then flew back. I mean, that's how, that's, yeah, that's the impact that she has on my life. Yeah. yeah. She, my, again, they're just smiling because they know. I, um, the foundation, we're in our um, 10th year of our Neighborhood Success Grants Program, and so we wanted to do a book to celebrate it and to lift it up. And so I'm in the shower, and I know, you know, that's for bathing, but that's where I do my best thinking. <laughs> and I thought, why not AGB? Because that's her nickname. Uh -huh. Why not AGB? She could write our foreword. Mm -hmm. And so we asked. And she said yes. yes. And so I shared it with the board when she said yes, and staff, and we're celebrating. And one of my best friends in the world, I had texted her, and I was like, I can't believe it. She said yes. And she was like, why wouldn't she? You're dope. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Other thoughts about why we should be having this conversation? Well, I, I can tell you how it's benefiting me. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, you know, it's great to see Latita, who I have not seen in years and uh, fellow GMFer, and, uh, and to me, Jennifer. Um, but what's crazy about both of these women and where they're physically located, mm -hmm. it's within the First Energy territory. Mm -hmm. So where I also give grants. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking for opportunities um, to be able to say whether or not First Energy should invest in this particular organization or consider collaboration between either organization for whatever makes sense. This conversation, if I weren't present, if Belva Denmark Tibbs hadn't called and said that she wouldn't take no for an answer for me to participate, <laughs> then I would not probably have met Jennifer and caught up with Latita. Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, um, why is this conversation important? If we're not talking about it, who will be? Yeah. 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 So it, it's, it, we need to continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. I was so happy. Uh, when I received the sponsorship information from Connie and I actually saw this event, I think it was part of the programming, um, for the entire, I, I'm not even sure if it, it's, it's not really a conference, but the exhibit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wondered who was going to be speaking on the panel, um, which I think was pretty funny that <laughs> I'm sitting up here right now because I, I was the last person that I was thinking about. But I think the conversation is important because we face so many challenges as women in the workplace, whether it's nonprofit, whether it's for profit, it's just every day it's a struggle. We come home, we're coming home to take care of our homes. Latita talked about how important that was. I expect if Jennifer talked a little bit longer, she may even chime in on that as well. And I know a few of my sister girlfriends that are in this room that balancing work every day, balancing family every day, balancing children balancing just life mm -hmm. and we need a space yeah. we need a space where we can come and we can share information we can love upon each other we can give each other everything that we can possibly but just do our best to fill them up so if we're not talking about this in philanthropy which I go back to what it means yeah. kindness humanity love of mankind that's what we need to continue to do with one another and I'm just glad to be here to do it I think, this, um, I think this event, again, this exhibit and this program, to your point, Lorna, I think this is the start of something big. I, agree. Um, I was so I agree. happy to hear about the equity fund that's established now. Yeah. And, 
you know, um, as I said, we're a, we're a national organization. We don't have chapters, actually. We just have a national structure. But there are regional groupings of blacks in philanthropy around the country. There are groups like Chicago, African Americans in philanthropy, and New York, blacks in philanthropy. And it really seems that this may be one of the sort of outcomes of, of this exhibit. It's, it's really important. But I want to pick up, um, Lorna, on one of the, the comments you made about this, this just work is hard. It's tough. Um, and to your point, Jennifer, that there are so few of us. So the data we have um, nationally suggests that um, about 2% of foundations across the country are led by black women. 2%. Very small number. Um, and uh, I was just curious. Um, sort of what the numbers look like here, just in your opinions, we don't have, we don't have the data, so we don't have to talk about specifics, um, but why you think that's the case? I'm just curious your thoughts about why that is the case. Mm. Is that the experience here, let me say, in Cleveland and Ohio in terms of, like I don't even know, and I just have to ask this question, are y'all it? I mean, I don't know, oh, no. <laughs> in terms of oh, leading no. foundations. I, okay, so I, there, I, there are more I of can... us. I can certainly speak to uh, one girlfriend who is in the room, who is the president of Omnova Foundation, yes. Teresa Carter. Yes. Raise your hand. Great. And I don't believe there's a soul in the room that doesn't know the name Margot James Copeland, who just retired from Key Bank, okay. um, who was probably the, the sister in philanthropy uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. um, even though they're headquartered here, well, no longer, I suppose. But um, with that said, there for me, um, I looked up to Margot and have for a long, long time. Um, I could not see myself, however, very interesting, 10 years ago in this seat. Um, I think it took some time for um, the culture around black women in executive roles, period, yes. in Northeast Ohio to change mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. She dug in early mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, never let go. Mm -hmm. But as she was moving forward, she was bringing others with her. Yeah. And uh -huh. so if we're not doing that, we will continue to have that 2%, yeah. did yes, you say? 2% national. Or, and I don't know what it is in the yeah. state of Ohio, yeah. but I'm grateful for folks like Margot and certainly for Teresa who I've met since I've been in this role, and their wisdom and pearls that they just drop from time to time, because that's the only way that I think um, that we will continue to maybe gain the confidence to go um, and apply beyond the vice president to the accepting the presidency role mm -hmm. um, in, in these very unique and genuinely, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the jobs that do, roles that don't come open very often. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah I, I would just agree that I think that it's difficult to grow in philanthropy, that there are increasingly opportunities, you know, fellowships like the Gun Foundation Fellowship that provides phenomenal um, on-ramps for folks um, into philanthropy, and then there are opportunities to be program officers. But then I think that um, continuing to grow in philanthropy is hard, and Jennifer told her story about that. And I think about the folks who were my contemporaries when I came into philanthropy, um, Stacey Easterling, uh, Marcus Walton. Um, these are folks who, when, it, when they, it came time for their next opportunity or their breakthrough opportunity, they had to leave Cleveland, unfortunately. I had to leave Cleveland, unfortunately. And I think, like, how amazing, now Cleveland is amazing, but how amazing would Cleveland be if I were here, if Stacy was here, and if Marcus was here, you know? And so I think that there's something about that. There's something about um, how do we um, continue to create ladders for people um, so that they can grow and stay in philanthropy. And whenever I have the opportunity to talk to young people, especially young women, who um, have an interest in philanthropy or who have found their way in philanthropy, I work really, really hard to encourage them to stay because it is such an opportunity for them, for our community. And so um, I think that, you know, to the degree that we can help folks hang on and grow while they're in. There's a young lady here who told me that she came to see me when she was like a student in graduate school and now she's working at the Nord Foundation. Where are you, honey? There she is. And that is amazing to me, you know, so. Amazing. So to the degree that we can 
create more opportunities like that for people to stay and grow, I think that is the challenge. You know, another shout out for Abfi. Abfi did a study a few years ago called The Exit Interview, was that it? Which was an amazing study that looked at um, what happens to folks after they get, black folks, after they get into philanthropy and why are the reasons that they leave. And it was fascinating to me to hear, you know, stories that resonated with so many people who I knew who loved it when they got in, but came into all the challenges that we've discussed and weren't able to stay despite their um, real interest in wanting to stay. You know, I just want to make sure that folks also know a sister in the room who I love dearly, Deborah Thomas. Can you just sort of stand up and raise your hand? Do you all know Deborah? Deborah just, Deborah just was promoted to the president of Philanthropy Ohio. Yes. So yes. this sister leads the regional association of foundations in the state. And there are only, I think we were counting three black women who are leading regional associations. So um, again, the opportunities to organize as black women and black people in this sector just grew because Deborah's in this position. So we are so excited about you. So excited about you, Peter. I wanna, um, let me jump into um, the being us in the sector. Um, and just the reality of, of racism, the reality of sexism. Um, talk a bit about how those dynamics play out for you, but more importantly, how do you take care of yourself? Because it's real. Okay, so I don't. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and, it's and real. No point yeah. in me making up an answer related to taking care of myself. My mother's present, she will tell you I do not. Yeah. I do not sleep. I, yeah. I may get three hours of sleep yeah. Yeah. a night. Yeah. Um, I try to, you know, I, I firmly believe in working hard and playing hard. And my girls are here. <laughs> and they're all doing the thing themselves. And we have a great time. Yeah. But we do need to take care of ourselves, just yeah. simply uh, as women and certainly as black women, considering all the health challenges and health disparities and what that looks like these days. Um, what was the first part of your question? Just how I, the dynamics, I but I thank you for your honesty and, and, your, listen, and your transparency. I, I couldn't because have answered I think, that any other way. I said my mother was here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but many of us, when we ask that question, you know, we have, a, a, a Latita talked about it every year. This is now the sixth year. We do a black women in philanthropy retreat. And we take a bunch of sisters and we go to the beach. Oh, I'm in. And, you know, you are in. You are in. Yeah. Um, and at first, it was difficult to get women to come, right, because it sounded like a vacation. <laughs> it sounded like we were playing around. <laughs> now, it is the toughest event to get into at AFI. And we spend time together. We love on each other. We meditate. We do yoga. Well, they do yoga. Um, <laughs> and we walk on the beach, and we talk about what it's like to be in these leadership roles. And it's absolutely necessary. We talk about, you know, folks often talk about work-life balance. And I used to ask people sort of, yeah, what's your work-life balance? Um, how do you take care of yourself? No such thing, right? Often what I'm saying now is how do you heal? How do you heal yourself? Because again, it's sort of recognizing the little microaggressions, the, oh, I see you as a senior vice president, not a CEO, those little chips that we, you know, carrying thing, the water for our families and the like. So it's real, and we do have to take care of ourselves. Lorna, it was how do the dynamics of race and gender, that was the first part of the question, sort of play out as it relates to the role that you're in, and then we'll hear from the rest of you. So that really is an interesting question for me. Um, I have been the first uh, in, uh, I guess, two or three roles with First Energy. So I'm the first black female president of the foundation. I was the first black federal lobbyist they've ever had. And I was the first female vice president of the Illuminating Company. I didn't join the company to break those barriers, I guess, if you will. Um, I like to say that I was absolutely qualified for each of those roles, uh, especially the current role that I'm in. After the time I put in in Washington, D.C., I think anybody should get anything after that experience. <laughs> but um, I do see some challenges from time to time with respect to racism. Um, but unfortunately, well, no, maybe that's fortunate, but it's not directed toward me. 
it's really directed toward the communities that we serve. And one of my colleagues is, is standing straight back there in front of me. And she uh, understands what, what I'm about to say here. So I mentioned earlier that First Energy is predominantly white male. We went through a diversity survey, I guess about two years ago, and it's about uh, at least 80, 82% white male. The role of the foundation and the effort behind uh, identifying organizations that we choose to support is largely in partnership with our full external affairs group. And as I mentioned, or maybe, maybe I didn't hear, um, First Energy uh, spans the Midwest and the Far East with five different states, uh, the rural areas of Pennsylvania. Um, we have the you know, metropolitan areas of Cleveland and of Akron. Um, but our challenges are really with the individuals that we rely on building relationships in the community and letting me know or letting my team know whether or not those are the right places where we should invest. What I'm starting to see in this role, particularly as we're planning and preparing for next year's budget, is the lack of interest and engagement in communities of color. And so when I push for a diversity and inclusion goal, which currently is 10% of our spend to 12%, and it probably really should be 15% next year, I hear a few grumblings, I hear a few moans, and I hear the question, well, how am I supposed to do that? And so when I say, it, so the racism and the, it's not toward me. Because at the end of the day, they know that, as I'd love to quote my mother again, I hold the pencil, I hold the pen, but I do make the decisions about their budgets and whether or not I'm gonna approve them and whether or not I'm gonna support the organizations that they wanna support. But if they don't think about the importance of serving the broader community, and thinking about what community means to the employees that work at the company. We're not gonna move this whole discussion about race and equality and about diversity and inclusion forward for First Energy. And so I fight that. I fight that, I push for that. Um, I challenge them to say, given the Urban League $500, for what, it costs you $500 to process the check that we just sent to them. Um, is it's, it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And while that may have been what happened in the past, it's not gonna be the direction <laughs> that we're going in the future. Yes. So, I push back. That's probably the easier of the two. The first, I think, um, one of my mentors asked me, do I see more of which, racism or sexism? And I was like, I can't separate, how, I don't know, how do I tell? Because um, it's so prevalent. But I would emphasize what Lorna is saying that I see it mainly playing out. We have, I'm gonna say two, but I think that's generous black-led organizations and using at these definitions, you know, the leadership of the board, staff, executive leadership, we have two in the Mahoning Valley. And so very similar, um, some of the other funders, and everybody has to do what they do. If you buy carpet, if you do roof repairs, but these are folks who are trying to take care of families, um, educational attainment and property values and those things that really make a difference of whether or not you're going to be able to survive in a community and they will buy a table at the banquet. Um, those things that will not pay the bills. And so very similar, I think we're a part of the conversations that it might be the only um, only the Wing Foundation at the table, um, because a lot of times our partners are just not interested in doing strategic um, grant making. And so we'll, we'll hold it down um, until they, till they catch on. Um, and then how I take care of myself, I run and um, I meditate 15 minutes every morning. Um, I think about a whole bunch of other stuff mainly, but I, <laughs> I sit there very quietly while I do it. And um, I, would say, <laughs> I would say my staff, 
I mean, I have such a dedicated um, board first. Um, it's community members. Gordon Ween is the one family member who sits on the board of nine, and our community members really do look out and cover me in the community. But more than them are these women who drove up after a full days of work from Youngstown today. I mean, late nights, weekends, we do what we have to do to get the work done, and I could not do it without them. I won't even say beside me, I'm like in front sometime leading the way because that's what has to happen. And so, and I like to go to the beach, so I'm definitely gonna be signing up for <laughs> the leadership retreat. Yes, you have to go. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm also not very good at taking care of myself, and I will own that. Um, I dream of being one of those women who wakes up in the morning and uh, runs or meditates or things like that, but usually I'm waking up in time to get the kids dressed and get out the door. Um, but when I, I do take care of myself by um, every, most days on my drive home from work, I talk to my best friend. She and I have not lived in the same city um, for over 10 years, but we talk on the phone every, every day. Her call reminds me it's time to go home, and then our calls on the way home um, keep me grounded, she keeps me lifted, and so um, she is she is how I take care of myself. Um, and I would also say that um, one of the blessings of being in a leadership role um, is that there are things that it affords you with regard to resources, with regards to autonomy over your time. And so um, I've gotten to this point where I no longer try to compartmentalize my life. I love my job, it is central to me. My family is central to me. So I will take off an afternoon to read at my kids' class. Uh, my, husband's and I, my husband and I um, go out to lunch all the time. At least like twice a week, we go out to lunch on a weekday because you don't have to pay for a babysitter because my free babysitters live in Cleveland. And so that way we don't have to pay the parent tax on top of the date, but it's our time to connect with each other and find out what's going on with one another. Um, and, so, and if I have to then spend a Saturday or a Sunday reading grant proposals, that's all good for me too. So being fully present in all the places that matter to me and not trying to like divvy it up or add it all up so that it would equal or be balanced is how I take care of myself right now. Um, and as far as um, the, the racism, sexism thing, I would agree. Like sometimes you never know what the thing is that is motivating people to act the way that they act. Um, and I think part of the blessing for me in being in Scranton is that I am hyper visible. So even though um, I had thought of myself as like a low key kind of a person, there's no way to be low key when you're like the only black woman <laughs> doing stuff in Scranton. Okay. Everybody knows who you are and, and you're all the way out there. And so, and I know our, so our attorney, we are a health foundation, um, a newer hospital foundation. So we still have like med malpractice cases that we have to manage. And we have an attorney who does a lot of that work for us. And he brings his bills to me and he always chuckles and says, hey, boss lady, because he thinks that's funny. When I'm signing his check. Um, <laughs> and so it's always there, you know? And, and for me, it's like, I'm gonna do the thing that I need to do. And I don't think much about other people's um, other people's hangups. I remember when I came to the Cleveland Health Department and I got the AIDS job, there were all these rumors about how I got the job. And I got the job because I saw it in the newspaper, because in those days you saw jobs in the newspaper. And I saw the job in the newspaper and I applied and they chose me, but there were these like rumors that my parents knew people, and my parents are lovely people. They know a lot of people, but no one who could get me that job. And so it was like a moment for me where I realized that people are gonna say whatever they're gonna say and I'm just gonna do my thing. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate these stories. Um, and it's so funny. Uh, so Jennifer, I, I, I am trying to be one of those folks that meditate. I even have the app on my phone, folks, right? That goes off, and as soon as it goes off, I go, what's that? And I hit delete, right? It's like, dismiss. Um, and you talked about girlfriends. Who talked about girlfriends? Lorna did. My, my Sands just walked in. That's my girl that keeps me grounded, Gail Huggins, and is actually from Cleveland. Um, so the importance of sisters and girlfriends, we know, um, is really, really deep. Um, so we could go on, but I want to open it up uh, to the audience for questions. And already, we've got some hands that have gone up. So how do you want to, uh, do we have a, I guess you all can just um, stand and uh, just share your question. Yeah. 
And I'm going to go to the sister right there and with the wrap on. Yeah, you. I mean, it's really hard. Um, and I will say that it's easier when you are in the, um, the C position. And so um, I don't think that I chimed in when you asked why this conversation is important. But one of the things that I would add is that um, leadership matters and who's in the leadership role matters. And even though you can lead from a whole lot of places, it matters when you are at the top because there are things that you can do when you're in that position. So hold on so you can get to that spot because there are things you can do in that position that you can't do when you're in other positions. Um, but I know that for me, um, early on, I used to always look for the midpoint, like it was something that you could mentally calculate, like it was a mathematical equation where I could like make the foundation happy, I could make the community happy, I could make the nonprofit happy, like if I could figure out that precise point, everybody would be happy. And more times than not, um, figuring out that point would piss everybody off and then I would feel like, um, you know, I had compromised it a lot and not gotten um, anywhere in doing so. And so what works for me, um, because again, I think a lot about holding space and being present with people, um, is I try to do my best um, to really hear um, the story from every side and also um, do my best to communicate both the constraints and the resources that are at my disposal. Um, and then you land someplace that feels right to you, recognizing it may not feel right to anybody else. But to me, that is the burden and the, um, the challenge of doing this work when you look like us. On, on my, uh, my desk, I have two things that are taped to, to my, my computer. One that says, manage what you can control. And the other one that says, leadership, it, what, oh Lord, I just forgot. Um, I just forgot. It just went out of my head. But it's related to leadership and culture. And so, but ultimately the point of it is, because I just scribbled it down, it was something I heard someone say and I can't even attribute it to anyone in particular. But the point of it is, when you're in leadership, and as Latita said, hang on to that, to, to your hopes and your dreams of moving up in that role and eventually leading the organization because there's no place to stop between the two. Just see yourself leading the organization and before you know it, you will be leading the organization. So just continue to see yourself that way. And when you do that, in leadership, you have an opportunity to change the culture. And so you speak your voice when you can. You push back when it's right and you allow yourself to make a mistake and you forgive yourself when you do. I'm in a space in the first seven months of this job where at least once a week I was like, what am I doing? I had zero experience in this role. So I envy those that went through fellowship programs and actually have worked your way up. I think there's incredible value in that. So don't, don't discount that and I don't think you do. But what I do hear, though, I think, is question about where the opportunities lie for the next step and how do I achieve it being my authentic self. You have to take the risk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would only add, um, I pray a lot <laughs> and call out to the ancestors and anybody else who will weigh in. And um, so I know my purpose. 
And I remind myself all the time of my purpose, and I ask the question constantly, is this where I'm supposed to be? And I wait for the answer, and I listen. So sometimes it's that. And I have two things on my desk, too, compliments of Lori. Um, you got this, and be still. And be still. I appreciate, um, I say, find your squad. Find your squad, and I'll just give you a piece of advice that a former president of a foundation said to our fellowship class when I was in the Yappy Fellowship a gazillion years ago. It sounds kind of um, harsh, but it's really Lorna's point about speaking your truth. When we look at the data of black folks in the sector of philanthropy, um, we recognize um, it's typically not sort of people rising to the top. Right? Typically, folks don't rise up to the CEO position. And I remember this gentleman said to our class, the likelihood of you being promoted in the foundation that you're in is slim to none, so you might as well rock the boat now. And what he was saying, what he was saying was speak your truth, because at the end of the day, that's, that's really what we have. So others, yeah, let me, there was all the way in the back, um, with the glasses, blue shirt, ma'am, right there, uh, yes. And if you can, um, I'm gonna, I'll try to repeat the questions I've been asked to do oh, that. Uh, okay. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Connie Atkins. I'm a 39-year entrepreneur. I have um, two statements and one question. I just want to let the young lady know that the CEO of St. Luke's has resigned. That job is open. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't Cleveland be awesome? Wouldn't you Cleveland be awesome? <laughs> and for Lorna, I've been on a lot of committees on the other side where I'm helping give out the money. And I was on this one particular committee, and we're trying to get them to increase the percentage that went out to the diverse vendor. I said, we're going to make this committee give out 100% of the next $100 million project to minorities and women in Northeast Ohio. And everybody almost fell off this year. So we gave out 64%. Okay. They used to give out 10%. Right. Okay. And I said, no, they made me chair of this committee. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to give out $100 million <laughs> to women and minorities on this contract. Mm -hmm. And they almost fell out. <laughs> but we gave out 64%. So don't be afraid to say the big numbers and then settle for, you know, <laughs> <laughs> My question is this. I've been reading about solar philanthropy and really appreciating the work of Connie Hill and Connie Hill Johnson. But I met her and she was Connie Hill. Um, and to Eliane, and everybody's been doing. I've been doing philanthropy since I was six years old. But my culture and my age group, like a lot of people, were taught to be very humble about what they're doing and why they're doing it and what have you. How do you encourage more people of color to share their story so that the project can grow. And I'm one of those people. I have lots of stories that nobody has no clue that I've done. I founded a minority scholarship endowment at a major university, but I did not put my name on it, okay? I don't need anyone to know I did that. However, I see the value of sharing the information for others to discuss and grow from. So how do you talk to people like me and many, many others who are doing great things in the community but never share it? Thoughts about that? <laughs> Somebody said that question goes to tell Andre. <laughs> tell Andre you got a you got a thought about that? Yeah? yeah? Thank you for the question, Connie. Um, so I will start by saying the question that you raised is the very reason why this room, in, this room is full. And so again, I thank you all for showing up to recognize the power of the stories that we hold and the importance of magnifying and amplifying those. Um, I think there's a couple of things I would offer. Um, I think one, it starts by each one teach one. Um, Part of what we're trying to do is help individuals see themselves as a philanthropist. Your name might not be on Lerner Tower. Your name might not be a brick in the new development downtown. 
um, but you are seeding gifts that are changing lives, moving communities, helping kids get to college, whatever that might be, might be. And it makes you no less humble to share that story and how you grew to be able to make that level of impact. Um, so I think it just starts by sharing. I think two, um, Sam is saying take a picture for Instagram showing that you are a philanthropist and post it. <laughs> so you can brag a little bit. There's no problem with that. Um, and another thing too I would say is um, we are also really trying to embrace and further the conversation about time, talent, and treasure. Because it can be really easy to just write the check, right? But how do you show up for community or someone else? How are you imparting skills and talent that are innate to you or that you develop that can be of benefit to someone else? And then I was reading on the Black Her um, uh, website, if you haven't heard about that um, as of late, but they also added testimony. And I was like, wow. That is so powerful, like that's the other T that we have to just show up in because it is about testimony. Um, so I think your question is very powerful, is no magic formula to it, we just need to start sharing our stories and our experiences and making sure that the broader community understands and it goes back to Susan's very early point that once society kind of puts you in the position of only being the taker, right? That, that story becomes ingrained in people's minds, but we're benefactors too. We give, um, and the broader world needs to understand that. Thank you. So you know what I'm gonna do? Um, I've got one question up front. Any other questions? Because I was gonna take two at a time. So uh, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna take three, and then ask you all to speak to anyone that you want. I wanna make sure that we get it. So let me go with you, sister, right here first. And you're so close, you can uh, just yeah. speak your question. In and I've got a big mouth. Okay. <laughs> so much so that I got to do this. So um, thank you. Um, and to the panel. So I've been thinking about um, philanthropy a lot, even more so than I always have, because um, I've worked in philanthropy in the past, in my past career. But thinking about it a lot this year, so um, many of you who know me know that I just sent my baby girl off to college this year. And so she went to an HBCU, Central State. And I thought about when we went through, when we drove up um, Wilberforce, and I remember as a little girl, so I grew up in the AME Church, St. Andrews in Youngstown, Ohio. That's where I grew up. And I remember my grandfather, Big Mama now, sitting around the table on a Friday night, literally passing around the bills of the church. Griffin, what you got? What you got? You got the light bill, you got the gas bill, you got the mortgage, what you got? And that's how they would fund the church. And the church, of course, has funded so much in our community. And when you think about HBCU, so I just say all of that to say, you know, philanthropy in the black community, how we started off, is just so profound. Like, that just hit my shoulders. Like, not only have we, I mean, got folks out of jail and pay folks rent and all of that, but think about schooling, education, um, you know, and just the churches and the impact that they've had on local communities. I mean, we have done so much. We invented this thing. And, you know, that's just, that's so profound to me. So to have a program like this that's promoting that, to remind folk the majority um, is right on time. So thank, thank you. you so much for all the Thank you, thank you, yeah. Questions, yes, right here. Sister, I know you're a soror, yes. Uh -huh. So we're going to take that one, and I'm going to take one more question, and then you guys can speak to um, all, any of which. Yes. Can 
you be too emotionally tied to the work? Oh, Lord, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, you all heard that last one. Can you be too emotionally tied? And then this question about, yep, foundations want measurement. They want impact. Um, and so any guidance you have or thoughts about um, ways in which organizations can be better stewards, often struggling with the issues around data, um, but ways in which, you know, nonprofits can be better stewards. So what's interesting about that for, uh, that I've learned with the First Energy Foundation is we don't push for it today. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so get the grant in soon. <laughs> Uh, we don't push for that today, but beginning in 2020, I am going to ask questions very differently. I inherited the budget, um, picked it up and just decided to try to do what I can do to support the community. Um, moved dollars around based on organizations that I knew were being underfunded for one reason or another. I used the Urban League as an example because I was just speaking about the Urban League yesterday in a meeting. It wasn't about metrics, it was about relationships. So one of the things that I would say for some of the smaller organizations, ones that um, are having difficulty connecting with corporate foundations and getting significant support or just what's even respectable support, is build a relationship. Do what you can, set up a meeting, come in, introduce yourself. I'm a big show and tell person. So if, if we've never supported you for whatever reason, invite me to your organization. Invite me out to come see what it is you do. Allow me to experience it. I would encourage that because some of the challenges with some of our organizations is providing that data, is providing um, a true impact report that's just not, that doesn't read as an annual report because there is a difference. I want to know how many people you impacted. I actually want to know if you used the dollars the way you intended, the way the application stated that you were going to use the dollars. So when you begin to kind of spell that out, sometimes it's really kind of fundamental, but oftentimes it comes back to really understanding what it is the foundation is looking for. And that's going to take communication. And you're not going to get that by just checking the website and seeing what the requirements are, what the giving priorities are, what the giving guidelines are. You need to spend some time and try to connect, especially if it's an organization that is in your community. If there is representation of that foundation that you have personal access to. Um, if you have questions about uh, preparing uh, impact reports, there are organizations here, trade associations, regional organizations that provide that kind of guidance and leadership, and they'll help you through that process. But I really think that a big piece of it is about relationships. I absolutely agree with Lorna. I would add that I think that um, the tide is changing some in philanthropy. Um, I think there are some funders who understand that effectiveness is about who has access to the people we want to serve and who is in the best position to serve them. And so that is a different you know, that requires a different set of metrics than kind of the traditional ones that people are um, used to using. Um, at the same time, there are foundations who want to reach a certain scale, you know, or have a certain um, breadth of impact. And there are some kind of like fundamental things a nonprofit needs to have to be able to do that. Um, but on the other question that Leah asked about passion, um, I don't think that passion is a liability. I think that passion is a reason why you need to take care of yourself. Um, because you need to renew so that you can be um, able to come in the next day. Um, but I think it's more of a problem that people who do not have passion are in the roles that they're in. And so um, to me, that's the root of the problem, not the people who have the passion. <laughs> I too live in the community that I serve, and I hope so. I hope that I'm overly ambitious and connected and overly concerned about everything. I hope that it keeps me accountable to the folks in my community. When you see me at the gym, when you see me at the grocery store, when you want to just reach across and touch because I know somebody who works there, I absolutely hope that's exactly how it works out. Acknowledging and 
Thank you for that. Um, acknowledging that um, we're not talking about them. We're talking about our families, our sons, right, our daughters. And I can't remember after which shooting it was um, or which killing it was, if it was Freddie Gray or Mike Brown. Um, with our membership of a thousand people around the country, I literally just said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to organize a conference call. We had 500 people on the phone not saying a word. But I said, just let's be. And someone, had, someone said a prayer. You know, we were on the phone for all of 15 minutes. But it was acknowledging that this isn't work for us. This is who we are, right? These are our families. So uh, I love the way Latita said it. Um, you know, just that's why the, the taking care of yourself is so important because we have trauma. We carry trauma about what's happening in our communities, right? Um, and then we're in these positions. And we have to be careful about that as well because we have to recognize that we carry trauma and we're doling out money. And we have to ensure that we're taking care of ourselves. We're not bringing you know, the wrong side of that trauma to our, to our work. So other last questions, any questions? Yes, sister, right here. And then one right here. So I'll take both of them. Yes. So I love what you said about um, the way you learn philanthropy from your family, Lorna. Um, how did you get I'll, let me just take one more, and then we'll speak to both just to get them all in. Sister right here in the red, I think. Hi, I'm Jessica Ford, and I'm actually on the other side of philanthropy. Yeah. So I do fundraising for one of the local colleges here. And I just feel like my career is shifting um, into maybe a reluctant leadership. Um, <laughs> and so I, and I know that there are probably lots of leaders here, and so I would love for you to pour into me as I think about taking a leadership role. But my question for you is, how did you know you were ready to take a leadership position? <laughs> and what prepared you? Like what kinds of things or characteristics or things that you need, knew you needed to have in order to step into a leadership position? OK. So what can we do for our community to ensure that we are raising a next generation? Sister, you look so familiar. I, I, am I, you know, everybody's got a twin. Um, <laughs> um, but then also, how did you know you were ready in terms of moving into leadership? Thoughts, reactions? To either um, of those. Well, I, I was going to say to Celeste that um, I'm not familiar with any programs, but I'd be interested in reviewing a proposal. Uh, I hear you. Got me? That's how we do it when we run things, right? That's how we do it. <laughs> and with respect to with, with respect, now, you all may, I, I don't know if you're familiar with any programs, if you want to answer her question. I'm not in Cleveland, but an example of what we do in the Valley, we have um, a resident council. And so those folks, some younger and some, I mean, runs the gamut in terms of age, but they make the funding decision for one of our grant funds. And um, I think it's a lot of exposure for folks in a way that hasn't been. It's a lot of leadership opportunities. And I think they then take that learning elsewhere. Um, we're still the only grassroots grant making program in the Valley, um, but we're mighty. And so I think it also could be an example to other organizations. So to the, le to the leadership question, um, I think that I also struggled with um, not seeing myself as a leader because I thought that um, there was a certain way that a leader looked. Like not that they were like white men. I was, I could see beyond that. But I thought that leadership looked a certain way or it felt a certain way. And in my mind, I thought, you know, I don't need to be in the light. Like I have enough self-esteem. I feel good about myself. Like I don't need to be at the top. Um, and I'm not loud, you know, like that's not my style. And so um, I was used to leaders being that way. And I even, there were people who told me that they just didn't see me in that role because I wasn't that way. Um, and for me, I think that when I kind of um, let go of that kind of stuff and said, um, I'm just gonna be me, 
and really, um, really um, own who I am. There's a quotation by Maya Angelou where she talks about um, like a woman who is in harmony with her spirit is like a, a river flowing that she um, arrives where she is fully prepared to be herself. And so, um, and so that's how I, and so for me, that's what my leadership is. It's not loud and out front and telling people what to do. It is listening deeply. It's hearing people's stories and it's being fully myself. So I think that, um, that um, for me, the challenge in leadership was trying to conform to somebody else's idea or what you read in a book about what a leader is as opposed to presenting um, what leadership could be um, for you. Um, and, and I was also reluctant. I think that, you know, if my circumstances had stayed the same, I could still be in the role that I was in. But I got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore, where I knew I had ideas about what needed to happen. And so, um, and for me, that pushed me to the next level. Uh, Susan, you spoke of having your squad, and I think those folks knew it before I did. Um, Gordon said, we were waiting for you. Um, Corey, one of our staff folks, said to Gordon, I'm not sure why we're looking, because Jennifer could do it. Um, Lori constantly, I mean, so the people around me, my husband, everyone told me, and I just had to get it in my head, because I think similar to you. And, and I feel like I'm a practitioner, I'm a worker bee. And it seemed to me that leaders had this vision that I didn't feel like I brought to the table. Like, I'll, you have the vision, somebody has to get the work done, that'll be me. And what I've learned, and it's on my board, part doer, part leader, and I was like, oh, or it could be that. So I think redefining what a leader is for you, just as you're saying, is exactly right, exactly on point. I, I don't disagree with anything that uh, either one of my panelists have said, um, I would add to that, that at least for me, particularly in this role, um, I'm very surprised that I'm here. Um, I have to remind myself daily that I deserve it, that I have worked my you know what off at this company, City of Cleveland, Downtown Cleveland Partnership, I can't even think that's even before all of that. But to get the plane dealer, who said the plane dealer? The plane dealer, um, to get to this point. But even with all of that, from time to time you doubt yourself. And I questioned um, whether or not I was ready because the irony of getting the call to come home from DC a little over a year ago, about 18 months ago, I mentioned to um, the guy that hired me to First Energy in the first place that I was interested in coming home and I wanted to be groomed for this job. That I wasn't ready by any means four months later to accept the job. I needed to be groomed for the job because I didn't think I was, I was ready. And I have my days where I question it. And then I have my days where I say, you know what? I know exactly what I'm doing and I need to trust myself. And trusting yourself is really the hardest thing. So when you realize that you can get past that, that self-doubt and you can see yourself, so just as I said, if you see yourself as the president, you can become the president, just keep thinking that. You'll get there. Amen, I love that, I love that. Wow. We could go on for, for a while, sisters, but we actually are running out of time. Um, one, one comment to the sister about what can we do in our community next gen. Um, Ebony Johnson Cooper runs something called Young Black and Giving Back. Was she here? I mean, that sister's work nationally is pretty amazing. So you all know her. Uh, you bought her here. There are a few models and examples of um, uh, young people in our community organizing, giving circles, you know, um, and Ebony's work nationally is just something to look at as we think about the important question that you ask. Um, so in closing, um, I, I wanted to just um, get your thoughts about the future of philanthropy and where you think the sector is going. Um, and given everything that's going on in this country and the craziness in, in Washington, um, also closing on a point of hope, 
Um, and that is what, what gives you excitement and what gives you hope as relates to the sector and say the next five to 10 years as a way to close out. So I would say that I am very um, inspired um, just because um, you can see a difference in the people who are at the table. I remember that when I came to St. Luke's Foundation in January of 2003, you could count the black folks in philanthropy on your hands, no toes, like one hand, maybe a couple of other fingers. Um, and now there are so many, many more people in philanthropy and not just people in philanthropy, in Cleveland, but also when you look nationally, people who are leading some of the major foundations in the country. So the Ford Foundation, NE Casey Foundation, Kellogg Foundation. I mean, there are um, women and men in leadership roles all over um, this country. And who's at the table matters and who's at the table changes the conversation. Um, and so I am inspired and I am very encouraged by that. In the next five to 10 years, I hope to be retired. Oh, no, 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 I don't hope to be retired. I will be retired. And I'm truly expecting uh, the millennials and the next generation to just completely blow up this whole ecosystem. Um, the thought that uh, we could still be in the same sort of stagnant space where there is limited or little leadership of color in this space in the next five to 10 years, it's just disappointing. I don't expect to see that because what I am seeing is a generation that's coming behind me that is full force and taking no prisoners. And I do truly expect some big changes in philanthropy. Um, speaking the truth, speaking your truth, um, this generation doesn't have any qualms with doing that. There may be some challenges that they may face with some of the old guard that's still kind of hanging around, but I encourage them to keep pushing forward. And uh, it'll be fun to see, and back to the joy of the work that we do, but it'll be really a lot of fun to see how it changes our communities. I concur. Um, <laughs> I would only add, um, I'm prayerful, especially when, Latita, you share what it looked like in Cleveland a decade ago, because that's what it looks like in the Valley a decade ago, decade ago and now. So I'm prayerful that we too can get there and keep it moving. And innovation, so millennials, like folks, yes, in 10 years, I too will be retired. <laughs> Gordon's like, what? <laughs> Who said? So the folks in the room who are saying the opportunities work hard, um, continue to grind. That's what we do. We continue to do. And then the innovation that can come about, the experimentation, just look it dead in the face. Um, it's what we're trying to do. It's what we're laying the groundwork for. So, you know, you can just be all out rock stars and without the heavy drinking in the late nights. Um, but all out rock stars, I'm prayerful that that's, that can be our reality. Folks, help me thank Latita, Lorna, and Jennifer. So appreciate this. I so appreciate you all. Tom Jay, can I turn it back over to you at all for any closing? Yes, standing ovation, because again, I told you, dynamic, powerful, beautiful. Personally, thank you all, ladies. We really do appreciate it. Thank you all for your attention tonight, for your presence, um, and just for um, engaging in a very important conversation. We have the space, so if you want to continue to network and hang out, the bar is still open, there's still food to be consumed. Um, but again, continue to engage with us on social media. Um, we are continuing this conversation. We have more programs coming up. Um, you can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can go to our website, which is simply tsopcle.com. Um, but again, thank you. We appreciate you. And remember, you're a philanthropist, too. And always give back. Have a great night. <laughs>